This video presentation and its accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care, AARC. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. As a registered participant, you are authorized to duplicate course materials for this program for each participant viewing at your facility. This presentation and accompanying materials can also be used by staff within the institution, but cannot be resold, distributed, or displayed for profit. Copyright 2016. All rights reserved. The following is a presentation of the American Association for Respiratory Care. Welcome to Current Topics in Respiratory Care. Today's topic is Non-Invasive Respiratory Support. Dr. Dean Hess is a registered respiratory therapist and fellow of the AARC. He is the Assistant Director of Respiratory Care at Massachusetts General Hospital and an Associate Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Hess is also the Editor-in-Chief for Respiratory Care Journal. Dr. Hess discloses relationships with Philips Respironics, Medtronic Covidian, Bayer, Daedalus Enterprises, Jones and Bartlett, American Board of Internal Medicine, and Up to Date. Hello, the objectives for this presentation are to compare high flow nasal cannula, continuous positive airway pressure, and non invasive ventilation, to discuss the evidence supporting the use of high flow nasal cannula, CPAP, and non invasive ventilation, and to select appropriate patients for high flow nasal cannula. CPAP and non-invasive ventilation. Now, as I think about non-invasive respiratory support, I think about this as high flow nasal cannula, continuous positive airway pressure, and non-invasive ventilation, the things that we will be discussing in this program. Shown here graphically is a comparison of the three forms of non-invasive respiratory support non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, and high-flow nasal cannula. And as you can see, with non-invasive ventilation, we apply an inspiratory pressure greater than the expiratory pressure, and in that way, we onload the patient's respiratory muscles and we improve the tidal volume that the patient receives. With CPAP, we apply to a face mask a pressure that is greater than atmospheric pressure but there's no additional assistance of the patient's breathing during the inspiratory phase, so the patient's respiratory drive and respiratory muscles are responsible for delivering the entire tidal volume and minute ventilation. With high-flow nasal cannula, as we'll discuss in detail over the next minutes, uh, there is a small CPAP effect, uh, often not as great as we might achieve with uh, CPAP itself, uh, there is also some onloading of the respiratory muscles and in that way some enhancement of the patient's uh, breathing and minute ventilation and the physiologic basis for that we will also discuss over the next several minutes. So over the last years, over the last five years or so, there has been an increasing interest in the use of high flow nasal cannula, both in adults as well as in children. Uh, in this presentation, what we will be talking about is high flow nasal cannula as it applies to the care of the adult patient. There has been this explosion in academic interest in the use of high flow nasal cannula. So back in 2010, there were really just a handful of uh, papers that were published on this topic. And in 2016, there will be, if we extrapolate out to the end of the year, I expect that there may be as many as 80 or more papers published on the topic of high flow nasal cannula as it relates to the care of adults. This is a schematic illustration from a paper published earlier in 2016 in Respiratory Care that shows the component parts of a high flow nasal cannula system. And the important parts of this system are the heated and humidification system. So the reason why we can deliver high flows uh, 
by nasal cannula, and by high flow I mean 30, 40, 50, 60 liters per minute, is because the gas is warmed and humidified. So that makes this therapy tolerable for the patient as compared to conventional nasal cannula therapy, where if we turn the flow even to 10 liters per minute, might be very uncomfortable for the patient. And then the system uses a wider bore tubing to accommodate that additional flow, and the nasal cannula prongs uh, are also of a larger diameter in order to uh, be able to, uh, to accommodate this additional flow. So the high flow nasal cannula system then consists of a heated and humidification system, a wide bore, uh, heated tubing, uh, nasal prongs, and then some way of providing flow with a high flow flow meter and being able to titrate the oxygen concentrator typically with a blender of some type. Since there's been this explosion of academic and clinical interest in the use of high flow nasal cannula, there have been uh, several uh, very good narrative reviews that have been published on this topic. So there was one in 2016 that was published in CHEST, uh, one published in Respiratory Care early in 2016, and another that uh, was published in Intensive Care Medicine. My point here being that with this explosion of academic and clinical interest in high-flow nasal cannula, there are now several good narrative reviews that have been published on this topic. So illustrated here are some of the uh, physiologic effects of high-flow nasal cannula. So as is illustrated by the arrows, there's a high flow that comes into the nostrils, a flow of typically, say, 50 liters per minute, and then that high flow uh, passes into the pharynx and then exits uh, through the mouth. So because of this high flow through the upper airway, that de decreases the resistance to inspiration. So no longer does the patient need to provide the inspiratory effort to overcome the resistance through the upper airway because of this flow of 50 liters per minute, which is passing through the nose into the pharynx. So that should then cause some reduction in the work of breathing for the patient, and it might result in some increase in tidal volume. This will also provide a small CPAP effect because the flow that is entering into the pharynx tends to oppose expiratory flow from the lower respiratory tract, and in that way may produce a small amount of CPAP. There is a minimization of room air dilution, so the high flow coming into the pharynx then uh, means that there will be little room air dilution so that it is possible to deliver uh, to the patient very precise and high concentrations of oxygen. And then the flow through the upper airway flushes the, the dead space or the carbon dioxide from the upper airway. So then this will also reduce the ventilation requirement for the patient by reducing the amount of dead space by clearing carbon dioxide from the upper airway that has accumulated there from the previous exhalation. So the results of these factors then can mean that the use of a high flow nasal cannula may reduce the minute ventilation requirement for the patient, may reduce the patient's respiratory rate or may re result in a reduction in the patient's respiratory rate and uh, with an improvement in minute ventilation. And in fact, uh, as is shown on this slide, in a number of studies that have reported respiratory rate or breathing uh, frequency with the use of high flow nasal cannula, there's a rather consistent effect of a lower respiratory rate with the use of high flow nasal cannula than with conventional oxygen therapy. And I think this is the result of that flushing of carbon dioxide or flushing of the dead space of the upper airway.
And note that there is a reduction in respiratory rate, which is shown on the left-hand panel of the slide, with either no change in arterial PCO2, illustrated on the right-hand side of the slide, or a reduction in PCO2. So the point here is that non or that uh, high flow nasal cannula can result in a lower minute ventilation requirement and may result in a somewhat lower arterial PCO2 because of these effects of flushing the upper airway of carbon dioxide and also reducing the resistance to flow through the upper airway. Now, as I had pointed out already, there can be some uh, somewhat of a CPAP effect associated with high flow nasal cannula, and this is because of the flow into the pharynx opposing the expiratory flow of the patient. And in this paper published in Respiratory Care back in 2015, you can see if you look at the green line, there is an increase in airway pressure with an increase in flow from the high flow nasal cannula. And that increase in pressure is about one centimeter of water for every 10 liters per minute of increase in flow. Also shown on this slide with the red line is the decrease in respiratory frequency or respiratory rate with the use of high flow nasal cannula. So again, a consistent effect of high flow nasal cannula is to reduce uh, respiratory rate. And then in the darker line at the bottom is shown the change in end expiratory lung volume, making the point that the CPAP effect not only increases the pressure within the lungs, but also results in some increase in lung volume. Now the interest in high flow nasal cannula really accelerated when this paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2015. And in this study, they looked at high flow nasal cannula in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory fa failure who were randomized to either uh, a high flow nasal cannula, standard oxygen therapy, or non-invasive ventilation. And on this slide, we are looking at the effect of, of, on, on endotracheal intubation. And you can see that the intubation rate is the lowest with high flow nasal cannula. It's also interesting that the intubation rate is the highest with non-invasive ventilation. And we'll come back in a few minutes and talk about why that might be, what might be the mechanism for that. In this paper, they looked not only at intubation rate, but they also looked at survival, perhaps the most important patient-related outcome and they showed that with the use of high flow nasal cannula for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, the survival rate was better with high flow nasal cannula than with standard oxygen therapy. And again, interestingly, the outcomes were the worst with non-invasive ventilation. So again, keep that thought in mind. We will come back and talk later about what might be the mechanism for that. So what kinds of patients were enrolled in this study? So this was an evaluation of high flow nasal cannula for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And if we look at the characteristics of the patients who were enrolled in this study, they were by and large patients with pneumonia. So this is really a study uh, for all intents and purposes of the use of high flow nasal cannula in hypoxemic patients uh, primarily due to pneumonia. This is from a review paper published uh, early in 2016 uh, that uh, I was actually uh, helped to prepare this review where we provided an algorithm that one might use clinically as an approach to the use of high flow nasal cannula. So uh, what we recommend here is that in patients who remain hypoxemic after uh, we initiate conventional oxygen therapy, we should then consider high flow nasal cannula at an initial flow of 50 liters per minute. And then if the patient has an improvement in their oxygenation on high flow nasal cannula, 
then we would de-escalate the therapy by keeping the flow at 50 liters per minute and reducing the FiO2, and then when we can maintain an adequate oxygen saturation, say at uh, an FiO2 of around 0.4, we might consider going back to conventional oxygen therapy. And it's also important, and we put this on the algorithm, that we need to monitor these patients carefully so that if the patient does not have a good response, then we need to think about how we will escalate therapy, which would typically mean that the patient would need to be intubated. Another area that has received uh, increasing attention related to high flow nasal cannula is the use of this therapy post extubation in patients who are at risk for reintubation. So, in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure, when it comes time to extubate that patient who has been previously intubated and mechanically ventilated, can we use high flow nasal cannula to reduce the risk of the patient failing extubation and needing to be reintubated? So that was explored in this paper published back in 2014, where they showed that high flow nasal cannula as compared to conventional oxygen therapy with a Venturi mask in this case, the high flow nasal cannula resulted in better oxygenation. And interestingly, if we look at the bottom two panels on this slide, there was also a reduction in PCO2 with the use of high flow nasal cannula and a decrease in respiratory rate with the use of high flow nasal cannula. So again, this supports the physiologic principle that I pointed out previously is that with high flow nasal cannula, there's flushing of carbon dioxide from the upper airway and that flushing of carbon dioxide from the upper airway, flushing of dead space, if you would, uh, results in a lower minute ventilation requirement for the patient and may cause some reduction in arterial PCO2. <clears throat> so this paper not only looked at physiologic response to the use of high flow nasal cannula, but also looked at patient outcomes. And the two, two of perhaps the most important outcomes that were evaluated here was the need for non-invasive ventilation and the need for the patient to be reintubated. And as you can see, as I boxed this on the slide, there is a significantly lower need for non-invasive ventilation or reintubation in patients receiving high flow nasal cannula. So I think this study provides support for the use of high flow nasal cannula to reduce the risk of uh, post extubation respiratory failure and the need to be reintubated. Then there was this study uh, also published in 2015 looking at high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive ventilation in hypoxemic patients after cardiothoracic surgery. And the, uh, the, the bottom line here is that high flow nasal cannula, when it was compared to the use of intermittent non-invasive ventilation, did not result in a worse rate of treatment failure. So this study essentially showed that in cardiothoracic surgery patients that the use of high flow nasal cannula was just as good as the use of non-invasive ventilation uh, in, the pa in patients who develop respiratory failure uh, following cardiothoracic surgery. Then there was this paper published about mid-year in 2016 looking at the effect of post extubation, high flow nasal cannula versus ox conventional oxygen therapy on reintubation rate. And this study looked specifically at patients at low risk for extubation failure. So the previous studies that I talked about looked at patients at risk for extuba extubation failure. This study looked specifically at patients at low risk for extubation failure. And if we uh, if we look at the uh, uh, success of the therapy in terms of reintubations, the reintubation rate was significantly lower in patients who received high flow nasal cannula as compared to those who received conventional oxygen therapy. 
So again, there is this accumulating evidence for the role of high flow nasal cannula post extubation, certainly in patients at risk for extubation failure, but perhaps also in patients at low risk for extubation failure. Now, another interesting application of high flow nasal cannula is to use high flow nasal cannula intermittently with non invasive ventilation. Uh, this was a paper published in Respiratory Care back in 2015 exploring uh, whether high flow nasal cannula could be used effectively in patients receiving non invasive ventilation who may not tolerate non invasive ventilation very well and need breaks from non invasive ventilation. And the study explored whether we could use high flow nasal cannula during those times that we take the mask off during non-invasive ventilation. And what was found in this study was that this uh, can be a very useful uh, indication for high flow nasal cannula so that in that patient who may be poorly tolerant of non-invasive ventilation, we give the patient breaks from non-invasive ventilation and when we take the mask off for non-invasive ventilation, we substitute high flow nasal cannula in its place. Another area that is generating some enthusiasm for the use of high flow nasal cannula is as a technique to deliver continuous aerosol therapy. So applications here might be in an asthmatic patient who needs continuous bronchodilator therapy, inhaled bronchodilator therapy, or in patients who uh, might benefit from an inhaled pulmonary vasodilator uh, delivered by aerosol, like an inhaled prostacycline, uh, where the, th the therapy needs to be delivered on a continuous basis, uh, can we deliver the aerosol through high flow nasal cannula? And this is just a picture of a setup with a mesh nebulizer on the dry side of the heated humidifier and then the uh, circuitry leading to the high flow nasal cannula. And I believe that there is uh, beginning to be some evidence supporting that this can be an effective way of delivering continuous aerosols. Now it's not a robust database. Most of the evidence to date are bench studies, but there is, I believe, some accumulating evidence that a way that we could think about using uh, high flow nasal cannula is as a vehicle for continuous aerosol uh, delivery. So now let's change, our, change the topic, uh, change our discussion from high flow nasal cannula to continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. So what is the evidence that we have for CPAP? Well, the best evidence that we have for CPAP is in the treatment of patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is a meta-analysis published now back in 2010 that includes probably about a dozen studies in this meta-analysis. And the bottom line is that looking at the outcome of mortality, very patient important outcome, there is a significant reduction in mortality with the use of CPAP in combination with standard therapy as compared to standard therapy alone. So I believe that many would now agree that the use of CPAP for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema should be a first line standard therapy in this patient population. We also have some evidence for the use of CPAP in patients who develop postoperative hypoxemic respiratory failure in this study, uh, published uh, back in to, uh, uh, 2005, uh, patients following major abdominal surgery who became, who uh, developed hypoxemic respiratory failure were randomized to either seven and a half centimeters of water of CPAP or standard oxygen therapy. And they found that the arterial PO2 improved more rapidly for CPAP, so a good physiologic effect but they also found that there was a lower intubation rate, lower pneumonia rate, and fewer ICU days 
and patients who receive CPAP. So this then provides some evidence for the use of CPAP in patients who develop, uh, who develop post-operative hypoxemic respiratory failure. We also have some evidence for the use of CPAP who develop, in patients who develop hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, following cardiac surgery. And in this study, they found that there were fewer pulmonary complications in subjects treated with CPAP than those who were not. And they also found that the ICU readmission rate was lower in patients who were treated with CPAP than those who were not. So I think that this, ten, this suggests to me then that CPAP might be an effective therapy for postoperative atelectasis, and we now have several studies, randomized controlled trials, as well as observational studies, and patients who have received various types of surgeries to suggest that CPAP has a role in the uh, patient who develops postoperative hypoxemic respiratory failure. We also have some evidence for the use of CPAP to prevent the evolution of acute lung injury in patients with hematologic malignancy. Uh, in this study, patients with uh, hematologic malignancy who received CPAP as opposed to conventional oxygen therapy had a much greater survival. So an area then where we might think about the use of CPAP is in this patient population. These are patients who we definitely want to try to prevent intubation because when these, patient, when these patients become intubated, they have very poor outcomes and CPAP might be a therapy that we could use to effectively reduce the intubation rate and improve the survival uh, in, in patients with hematologic malignancy. Now what about patients with ARDS? hypoxemic respiratory failure with ARDS. Does CPAP have a role there? And I think we have to be cautious about the use of CPAP in this type of patient. In this study, patients were randomized to either oxygen therapy or mass CPAP. And perhaps not surprisingly, after one hour of therapy, there was subjective improvement. In other words, the patients were breathing more com comfortably and the oxygenation was better in the patients who received CPAP. So initially, at least from physiologic sorts of criteria, there was an improvement with the use of CPAP. However, as they continued to follow these patients, there was no difference in intubation rate or mortality. And in fact, there was a higher number of, there were a higher number of adverse events in patients receiving CPAP. And by adverse events, it was things like the patient coded at the time of intubation. I think we would all agree that that's an adverse event. So these authors suggested, and I agree, that we have to be cautious about the use of mask CPAP for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in patients who we may consider to have ARDS. So we should think about CPAP for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Those patients are hypoxemic. We should think about the use of CPAP in patients with post-extubation or post-surgical respiratory failure, or use of CPAP in post-surgical respiratory failure, and those patients are hypoxemic, but not, but not in patients with ARDS. Now let's move our conversation to the use of non-invasive ventilation. So on this slide is my current scorecard for the evidence supporting the use of non-invasive ventilation. And you can see that at the top of the, of the slide, the best evidence for the use of non-invasive ventilation is in patients with COPD exacerbation, in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and to prevent extubation failure. There used to be, I thought, good evidence to support the use of non-invasive ventilation in immunocompromised patients, although you can see now that there are some question marks that I have placed uh, on the slide, and we'll come back and talk about that a bit more in a few minutes. And then there are other areas where non-invasive ventilation might be considered 
but the evidence is less robust. And then there's one group of patients, patients with ARDS, where I think we have to be careful about the use of non-invasive ventilation. There was published in 2015 this very well-done meta-analysis in critical care medicine that looked at non-invasive ventilation and survival in, a, in, a, in the acute care setting. And this was a comprehensive systematic review and meta-analysis. As I said, I th think this is a very well-done uh, meta-analysis. And in this study, they used one of the metrics of evidence-based medicine, which is the number needed to treat, the number needed to treat being the number of patients that we need to treat with a therapy like non-invasive ventilation in this case in order to avoid a single bad outcome, the bad outcome in this case being that the patient dies. So that you can see on this slide for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, treatment of post-operative respiratory failure, treatment of post-extubation respiratory failure, the number to treat is very low. We only need to treat a few patients with non-invasive ventilation in order to save a single patient's life. So very strong, robust evidence for the use of non-invasive ventilation, something that we do every day as respiratory therapists, where we only need to treat a few patients with this therapy in order to save patients' lives. So I actually was asked to write the editorial to go with this paper, which I thought I cleverly uh, titled, The Evidence is in Non-Invasive Ventilation Save Lives. Now what about acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema? So I had said previously that we should think about the use of CPAP in patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And then on the previous two slides, I had suggested that we should use non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So what should we use? Well, in this same meta-analysis that I had uh, pointed to earlier, they looked at the use of non-invasive ventilation versus CPAP in patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And the bottom line take home message from this slide is that there is no difference as far as mortality. So then if you elect to use CPAP for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the evidence supports that. If you elect to use non-invasive ventilation for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the evidence supports that. There really is not robust evidence to say that one approach is better than the other. Now let's get back to this subject of the use of high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And when we were talking about high flow nasal cannula, I pointed out that the survival was better in this study with high flow nasal cannula and the survival was worse with non-invasive ventilation. And in fact, in a secondary analysis of the data from this study, the authors looked at the use of high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive ventilation in patients who were immunocompromised. And again, they found that in the subgroup of patients in this study with immunocompromise, the outcomes were best with high flow nasal cannula. They were the worst with non-invasive ventilation. So then this causes me to have pause about the use of non-invasive ventilation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and particularly for patients with immunocompromise. So what is the mechanism for this? So how can we explain that the patients who received non-invasive ventilation had the worst outcomes? Well, we may get a clue from this paper published in Critical Care Medicine early in 2016, where they found that the size of the tidal volume was an important determinant of non-invasive ventilation failure. In other words, patients who, with hypoxemic respiratory failure who generated higher tidal volumes on non-invasive ventilation 
who are more likely to fail non-invasive ventilation and need to be intubated. Well, why is that? Well, we now know that the size of the tidal volume is important in determining the risk for ventilator-induced lung injury. So in non-invasive ventilation, particularly in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure, where the patient generates a high tidal volume on non-invasive ventilation, that patient may be injuring their lungs, resulting in non-invasive ventilation failure and the need for intubation. So I think there's a very important message in this slide for we as respiratory therapists. And that is that we need to pay as much attention to tidal volume during non-invasive ventilation as we do when we intubate the patient and provide invasive ventilation. So we should be targeting low tidal volume lung protective ventilation, whether the patient is being ventilated through an endotracheal tube or the patient is being ventilated with a face mask. Now what about the use of non-invasive ventilation for ARDS? So my basic message here would be don't do it. Uh, so for example, we have this paper uh, published back during the H1N1 epidemic from the Canadian Clinical Trials Group, where they reported that about a third of patients across Canada who developed H1N1 ARDS uh, received initially non-invasive ventilation. But notice that 85% of those patients who initially received non-invasive ventilation failed and needed to be intubated. So be careful about the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients with ARDS, particularly patients with moderate to severe ARDS. Now, an area where there has been a lot of interest, I think, over the last 10 years or so in the use of non-invasive ventilation is to reduce the risk of uh, of reintubation or reduce the risk of extubation failure. In other words, post-extubation non-invasive ventilation. So we could think about using non-invasive ventilation as a way to extubate our patients earlier. So we might, for example, think about in selective patients like patients with COPD, patient fails their spontaneous breathing trial and we, despite the failure of the spontaneous breathing trial, we extubate the patient to, to non-invasive ventilation. Although there's some evidence to support that, I would say be cautious about that. The area where we have the best evidence for the use of non-invasive ventilation post-extubation is to prevent extubation failure. In other words, to use non-invasive ventilation in patients who are at risk for, for uh, post-extubation failure. So this might be a patient who does well on their spontaneous breathing trial, but maybe the patient's elderly, maybe the patient has comorbid conditions like COPD and cardiogenic uh, uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, maybe the patient got extubated a few days earlier and got re-intubated. So the patient's at, re at risk for, uh, for extubation failure and needing to be re-intubated. Now I believe there is a robust evidence base to support the use of non-invasive ventilation in those patients. Now what about the patient who gets extubated and initially does well, but now it's six, eight, 10, 12 hours later and the patient's back in respiratory failure, can we use non-invasive ventilation to rescue that failed extubation? And I would say be very cautious about that there are at least one randomized controlled trial that showed that the use of non-invasive ventilation to rescue failed extubation resulted in poorer patient outcomes. Now, I think the one exception to that rule is in patients with COPD, where we have a lot of evidence to support the use of non-invasive ventilation. So we might think about using non-invasive ventilation to rescue a failed extubation in patients with, with COPD. But outside of that, I think we need to be very cautious. And then as respiratory therapists, I'm sure we'll be happy to know that the evidence does not support routine use of non-invasive ventilation post-extubation. 
And there was actually a paper that we published in Respiratory Care a couple of months ago that explored that question and they found that routine use of non-invasive ventilation post-extubation did not improve outcomes. So we should think about it selectively in patients who are at risk for extubation failure. Now just a few words about the types of interfaces that we can use for non-invasive ventilation. Something that's changed a lot over the last 20 years is the variety of different types of interfaces that we have for non-invasive ventilation, the sizes of interfaces, the manufacturers of interfaces, and so forth. Uh, I think the take home message on interfaces for me is that when initiating non-invasive ventilation for acute respiratory failure, it's better to begin with either an oronasal mask or a total face mask because mouth leak can be very problematic in these patients. So nasal interfaces may have a higher failure rate. Now one of the interfaces, so if I just go back for a minute, one of the interfaces that you can see here in the bottom right hand panel is the helmet device that fits over the entire head of the patient. And this is an interface that is quite popular in some parts of Europe and South America. But what about, do we have any evidence from North America for the use of the helmet device? Well, interestingly, there was this paper published mid-year in JAMA in 2016, looking at the use of a helmet for non-invasive ventilation as opposed to a standard oronasal face mask in patients with uh, ARDS. You know, this is a, a patient population who uh, just a few minutes ago I said we should probably not use non-invasive ventilation for ARDS. But in this study, they looked at non-invasive ventilation for ARDS, randomized patients to the helmet device versus the full face mask. And you can see there was a significantly better survival in patients who received the helmet device. So does this mean then we should all go rushing out and purchase the helmet for use during non-invasive ventilation and even use it in our AR ARDS patients? Well, maybe not so fast. So there is not currently in the United States or in North America, United States or Canada, there is not currently a helmet device that is approved for non-invasive ventilation. And in fact, shown on this slide is the helmet device that was used in that study in JAMA. And I copied off of the website of the manufacturer of that helmet where they make it very clear that the intended use of this helmet is in hyperbaric chambers and the intended use of this helmet is not for non-invasive ventilation. So this is what we all want to avoid when we apply non-invasive ventilation and hopefully none of us have ever seen any of our patients whose face was uh, had uh, this much, this amount of facial skin breakdown, their face looked like this after we applied non-invasive ventilation. But I think that all too commonly, this sort of thing can occur. So what can we do to minimize the amount of facial skin breakdown with non-invasive ventilation? Well, we can assure a correctly fitted mask. We now have many different types of masks to choose from, so choose one that has a good fit, adjust the headgear, adjust the forehead spacer, Many of the ventilators that we use have good leak compensation, so we don't have to strap it on so tightly that there's not even a milliliter of air that can leak around the mask. Uh, we can try to use uh, different kinds of interfaces. So if we're getting some facial skin breakdown with an oral nasal mask, maybe we can try a total face mask or a hybrid device. We can rotate interfaces, use one type of interface, maybe during the daytime, another type at night. We can re remove the mask for short periods of time if the patient tolerates that. And then we can use uh, hydrocolloid dressing, which is available from several different manufacturers that we can tape onto the face and reduce the amount of pressure that the interface applies to the, uh, the patient's, uh, patient's skin. Uh, 
Now, this is a paper we published in Respiratory Care back in 2014, where they looked at factors affecting skin breakdown during non-invasive ventilation. And there were two uh, primary findings in this study. One, which is the bottom finding, is that the longer that a patient receives non-invasive ventilation, the greater the risk of skin breakdown. That's probably no real big surprise. However, the other thing that they found in this study was that in patients who received an oronasal mask, uh, who received non-invasive ventilation with an oronasal mask, had more than an 80 times greater risk of, of, re of having facial skin breakdown than patients who received the total face mask. So let me say that again. So in patients who received non-invasive ventilation with an oral nasal mask, there was more than an 80 time greater risk of de developing facial skin breakdown than with the total face mask. So this is what the total face mask looks like. Uh, so I think everyone knows what an oral nasal mask looks like. This is the total face mask. These are available from several manufacturers. And this study, again, showed that the risk of facial skin breakdown was much lower when they used a total face mask as compared to an to a oral nasal mask. So you might think about this as an interface to reduce the risk of facial skin breakdown. Now, what about the ventilator for non-invasive ventilation? We now have a variety of different ventilators that we can use for non-invasive ventilation. So there are the bi-level devices that we have typically thought about for non-invasive ventilation. There are intermediate types of ventilators used more so, I think, in, in home care than in the acute care setting. And increasingly, critical care ventilators now also provide non-invasive ventilation modes so that it's possible that the same ventilator that we might use with an intubated patient, we can use uh, to provide non-invasive ventilation with a face mask. And what is important in regards to the ventilator for non-invasive ventilation is how well the ventilator compensates for leaks. Because with face mask ventilation, with non-invasive ventilation, leaks are going to be a reality. So it's important that the ventilator that we use compensates well for leaks. So this paper published in CHESS back in 2012 looks at different ventilator types and how well they compensate for leaks, and they did that on a bench study, and then how well that translates into patient ventilator interaction or patient ventilator uh, synchrony in patients receiving non-invasive ventilation. And here's what they found. So they divided the types of ventilators into three groups. So the non-invasive ventilators, so those are the one, the bar all the way to the right on the slide, these are the ventilators that have been traditionally used for non-invasive ventilation that traditionally have good leak compensation algorithms because they were designed specifically to be used with non-invasive ventilation. And then we are also looking at critical care ventilators, uh, either with the non-invasive ventilation mode turned on, NIV plus, or turned off, NIV minus. So in other words, in this study, they compared patient ventilator interaction during non-invasive ventilation using a traditional ventilator designed for non-invasive ventilation to an ICU ventilator with either leak compensation turned on or turned off. And what they found, as you can see on this slide, is that the devices traditionally designed for non-invasive ventilation outperformed as a group the critical care types of ventilators. But I also want to point out how, how large are the bars and the whiskers around the bars for the critical care ventilators. So what that points out is that there's a lot of heterogeneity among devices. So in other words, there are some critical care ventilators that compensate very well for leaks 
as well as traditional ventilators we use for non-invasive ventilation. However, there are other ventilators that compensate very poorly for leaks. The leak algorithms may not be nearly as good. So there's a lot of variability among critical care ventilators as to how well they do leak compensation. So Rich Branson and I wrote an editorial that goes with this paper, and we titled it, Know Your Ventilator to Beat the Leak. I think we thought we were being clever. I don't know if we were or not, but uh, the point we were trying to make here is that uh, not all ventilators perform equally when it comes to leak compensation. So you need to know how well the ventilator you use in your practice compensates for leaks. Now, a question that comes up sometimes is, well, in a patient, say we have a patient with COPD exacerbation, we put on non-invasive ventilation, the patient also needs inhaled bronchodilators. How do we deliver the inhaled bronchodilators during non-invasive ventilation? Well, certainly one thing we could do is to take the patient off of non-invasive ventilation and deliver the inhaled bronchodilators in the traditional way with a nebulizer or a meter dose inhaler and spacer. But the problem with that is that that interrupts the therapy, that interrupts the non-invasive ventilation. We now have, I think, evidence from a number of good bench studies and a few uh, clinical studies suggesting that we can effectively administer nebulizers during non-invasive ventilation, inline during non-invasive ventilation. We can effectively deliver meter dose inhalers uh, with uh, in line with non-invasive ventilation. And we can also use mesh nebulizers and there are some commercially available systems now where the mesh nebulizer actually locks right into the mask to deliver aerosol therapy. And I think they're, they're available now from uh, several manufacturers. Now, one important thing that I illustrate on this slide is the position of the nebulizer or the position of the meter dose inhaler and spacer, and notice that it is close to the mask. So the evidence then suggests that if we're delivering bronchodilators during non-invasive ventilation, we should position the aerosol generator close to the mask rather than closer to the ventilator. So this is different, uh, so that the technique here is different with non-invasive ventilation than it might be with uh, invasive ventilation. So in summary then, uh, what can we say about high-flow nasal cannula, CPAP, non-invasive ventilation? Well, I think about the use of high-flow nasal cannula with hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, such as in patients with pneumonia, and patients with uh, post-extubation, hypoxemic respiratory failure, Think about CPAP for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, immune compromise, post-operative respiratory failure. I think about non-invasive ventilation for COPD exacerbation, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, post-operative respiratory failure, post-extubation. And I think what is very important here is that we select our patients appropriately so we know which types of patients will respond best to which therapy. We also need to have in place stop criteria. So we need to know when the therapy is failing and we have to monitor our patients carefully so we can recognize when the therapy is failing so that we can escalate care appropriately. And we should, although I'm a firm believer in the role of non-invasive respiratory support in patients who are failing the therapy, we should be careful not to delay intubation, which could uh, result in poorer outcomes for our patients. And then I'd like to show this uh, paper that was published back in 1977 by the then editor of Respiratory Care, uh, Philip Kittredge. And Phil sent a letter to the editor on Respiratory Care where he said that continuous positive airway pressure, or in other words, non-invasive ventilation, is no longer a new therapy, nor alas is the strapped positive pressure breathing mask a new device. It is rather as antiquated as it is inhumane and unsafe. Pretty harsh words from the then editor of Respiratory Care. And then he goes on to say that a patient 
who is sick enough to need CPAP is sick enough to need an endotracheal tube. So you heard what I've had to say over the last 45 or 50 minutes about uh, non-invasive respiratory support, and you can tell that the current editor of Respiratory Care does not agree with what one of my predecessors wrote in a letter to the editor. I'm sure today he would not agree with that either, because today, non-invasive respiratory support is evidence-based in appropriately selected patients. So thank you very much.